This is Radio 4 with a sincere message for all our listeners. Friends, we're gathered here today to listen to The Loved One by Evelyn Wall. And friends, I want you to know that it was adapted for radio by Bill Matthews. Episode 1. Ah, here at last, Dennis. Uh, sorry, Mr. Schultz, if I'm not late. No, 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 just in time. I've left you a raccoon. Shouldn't take you more than ten minutes. Nothing else? No, but if anything else comes in, just put it straight on ice. I'm off. Me only cruel immortality consumes. I wither slowly in thine arms here at the quiet limit of the world. Here at the quiet limit of the world. Here. The happier hunting ground? Mrs. Theodore Heinkel, Mrs. Walter Heinkel of 207 Theatre de Rosa Bel Air. Oh, you must come at once. I can't tell you over the phone. It's my little Arthur. They've just brought him in. He went out first thing and never came back. But, but I didn't worry because he's been away like that before. You know what they're like. I said to Walter, Mr. Heinkel, I said, but Walter, how can I go out to dine when I don't know where Arthur is? And there are dog catchers around every corner. And I will come at once, Mrs. Heinkel. 207 Via Della Rosa, I think you said. I was on Mr. Lester Scrunch's right hand when they brought me the news. Oh, he and Mr. Heinkel had to help me to the automobile. Can I get once? No, I shall never forgive myself as long as I live. To think that he was brought home alone. Alone. Even the maid was out. And, hello, are you there? I said I'm on my way, Mrs. Heinkel. Goodbye. I am the happier hunting ground. Am I glad to see you. This has been a terrible experience for Mrs. Heinkel. I don't want to see him. I don't want to speak of it. The happier hunting ground assumes all responsibility. Yeah. Whiskey, Mr. Barlow? No, no, thank you. Not while I'm on duty. I think I will. I have with me our brochure setting out our unique service. Now, were you thinking of interment or incineration? Pardon me? Buried or burned? Burned, I guess. I have on my person details of various styles of urn. The best will be good enough. Now, would you require a niche in our columbarium, or would you prefer to keep the remains at home? What you said first. And the religious rites, we have a pastor who is always pleased to assist. Oh, well, Mr... Barlow. Mr. Barlow, I think on an occasion such as this, Mrs. Heinkel will want all the comfort you can provide. Well, our grade A service includes several unique features. At the moment of committal, a white dove symbolizing the deceased soul is liberated over the crematorium. Yes. Yes, I'm sure Mrs. Heinkel would appreciate the dove. And every anniversary, a card of remembrance is mailed without further charge. It reads... Your little Arthur is thinking of you in heaven today and is wagging his tail. That's a very beautiful thought, Mr. Barlow. You have certainly relieved me of a great responsibility. That is the aim of the happier hunting ground. Now, shall I attend to the deceased? Another Frank? Thank you, my boy. Not so much solo this time. Yes, I've never regretted the move to Hollywood. The climate suits me, the people are decent and generous, and most of all, they don't expect you to listen. People talk entirely for their own pleasure. Nothing they say is designed to be heard. I said, evening, Frank. Evening, Barlow. Sir Ambrose. What a pleasure. Another scorcher, eh? Do you mind if I take a pew? Uh, whiskey? Excellent. Well... Right up with soda, please. So, how are things with you? Oh, mustn't Barlow. Oh, I'm fine, thank you. We haven't seen you on the cricket field lately. 
Very busy at Megalow's studios, I suppose. No, as a matter of fact, my writer's contract expired three weeks ago. Did it, by George? Well, I expect you're glad of a rest. I know I should be. If you'll take my advice, just rest easy until something attractive turns up. These fellows out here respect a man who knows his own value. Of course. We limeys have a peculiar position to keep up, you know, Barlow. They may laugh at us sometimes, the way we talk, the way we dress, our monocles. They may consider us cliquey and standoffish, but by God, they respect us. You only meet the finest type of Englishman out here. Absolutely. Yes. You know... I often feel like an ambassador, Barlow. It's the responsibility in, in varying degrees we all share it. You never find an Englishman among the underdogs? Except in England, of mm. course. Out here, there are some jobs an Englishman simply doesn't take. Of course not. Absolutely not. I don't say poets are much in demand, Barlow, but they're bound to want one for something one day, and when they do, there you'll be quill in hand. If you haven't done anything to lose their respect in the meantime, that is. No. Well, I didn't come here to rabbit on at you, Barlow. I came to see how my old friend Sir Francis is faring. Been meaning to look you up for a long time. It's so rare one socializes outside Bel Air these days. You shouldn't hide yourself away, Frank, you old hermit. Oh, you used to live not so far away. Did I? Upon my soul, I believe you're right. <laughs> Just across the street, wasn't it? We were neighbours. You were living in Bel Air. Ah, yes. So how are things for you at Megalo? Greatly disturbed. We're having trouble with Juanito del Pablo. The dusky Spanish beauty. It was her eyes we bought her for originally. She was called Baby Ellis, and then from Chicago. Yeah. She had a splendid eyes and a fine head of black hair. So we made her Spanish. Had most of her nose cut off and sent her to Mexico for six weeks to learn flamenco dancing. <laughs> and that was the new angle then, and it caught on. And she was really quite good in her way. The skull came naturally to her. The legs were never a foot of Zanique, but we kept her in long skirts and used an understudy for the lower half in scenes of violence. <laughs> she was good for another ten years' work at least. But now there's been a change of policy at the top, we're only making healthy films to please the League of Decency. Ah, yes. Healthy films. All for them. So now, Spain is out, and Juanita has to start all over again as an Irish Colleen. They bleached her hair and dyed vermilion. Aren't Colleen's meant to be dark? I tell them that. But they say vermilion looks better in Technicolor. So, she's working ten hours a day learning the brogue, and just to make it harder for the poor girl, they pulled all her teeth out. She never even had to smile before. Now she has to laugh roguishly all hours of the day. <laughs> I spent weeks trying to find a name to please her. But there are two Maureens already. There are more than enough male pets. No one could pronounce Deirdre and Una sounds Chinese. So she's nameless, toothless, and well... <laughs> Yes, you're quite right. Healthy films. I've always had two principles throughout my life in motion pictures. Never do before the camera what you would not do at home. And never do at home what you would not do in front of the cameras. <laughs> Very good. It wasn't meant to be funny. Oh, sorry, it sounded as if it should be. Well, I must be toddling. So long, Frank. I enjoyed our talk. Wish we saw you more often down at the cricket club. Goodbye, my young man, and don't forget what I said. No need to move, either of you. I can find my way. What do you make of that? He's heard something. Well, it was bound to come out. Yes, I suppose. To think. When the young Ambrose first came here, I was the only knight in Hollywood. Chief scriptwriter of Megalopolitan Picture and even president of that blessed cricket club. Then along came Abercrombie, bouncing about unnecessarily in his famous series of fatiguing roles, acrobatic, heroic, historic, or whatever. Now English titles abound in Hollywood, several of them authentic. No, I actually managed to write today. Thirty lines. Would you like to read them? No, no, no. Your efforts would only distress me, and I might be led to question the value of the sacrifice that I at present applaud. 
you are a published poet. You received a two-column review in the Sunday Times. You, my boy, are the hope of English poetry. The only way I can continue to believe that is never to read your poems. I've served the cause of art enough by allowing you to reside here. And did I not counsel you to leave that studio? Yes, you did, a thousand times. Surely not so often, once or twice when I was in liquor, I think. <laughs> and my advice to return to Europe was passed up in favour of your present macabre employment. Tell me, do you think you give your employer satisfaction? Well, my manner is congenial, he told me so. The man before me caused offence by his gusto. Clients find me reverent. It's the combination of melancholy with an English accent, I think. But what of our fellow expatriates? We cannot expect sympathy from them. What did our late visitor say? There are some jobs an Englishman just doesn't take. Yours, dear boy, is preeminently one of those. Gentlemen, oh, yeah. oh, please, we're wasting time. Yeah, so, so, so this Liprachon, he's the villain, right? I thought he was the good guy. No, 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 that's the fairy's changeling, right, Sir Francis? Uh, what I don't get is why this Colleen wears no shoes. Yeah. Don't they have no shoe shops in Ireland? No. <laughs> Sir Francis? Well, um, uh, I'm not sure that's essential to the story. Story? Uh, uh, I, I lost it when that banshee came in and wailed the house down. Yeah. Wasn't that her mother? Whose? This girl, what's her name? Uh, Colleen. Well, I thought the point was she didn't have a mother. Yeah. What? We can't have a film without a mother. <sighs> so, guys, what do we think? Uh, no. 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 At least no one can say I'm surrounded by yes men. <laughs> 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 hey, take a week at home, Frank. Try to work on a new slant. Or oh, maybe you feel kind of allergic to the assignment. Yeah, no, 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 not at all. This conference has been most helpful. I now know what you gentlemen require, and I'm sure I shall have no further difficulty. Thank you. Always pleased to look over anything you cook up. <laughs> Goodbye. Thank you. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Bye-bye. <laughs> oh, dear. Just another has-been. Yeah. There's a cousin of my wife's just arrived. Uh, maybe you could give him a tryout on the job. Yes, yeah, Sam. Have your wife's cousin look it over. It seems we're both in trouble, my boy. Yes, perhaps. Juanita's agent is now trying to find a lawyer who can prove she doesn't exist and therefore cannot be bound to her contract with me. Their argument is that she's changed her identity, albeit to another that is not her own. In fact, I believe she cannot now remember who she originally was. Yes, my boy, we're both in it. Oh, I don't know. Schultz put my wages up again today. In your victory lies your defeat. Your social ruin was consummated by that photo of you in the local paper. Yes, I was rather pleased with it. Isn't it illegal to scatter the ashes of a tabby cat out of an aeroplane into the slipstream of Sunset Boulevard? No, only if the remains are human. Megalopolitan, how may I help you? Hello, this is Sir Francis Hinsler. My secretary has failed to arrive to take dictation. You'll want the administration department putting you through. No, I don't want administration or personnel or lost and found, to all of which I've been put through already. I want you to tell me what has happened to Miss Mavro Cordato. One moment. Yes, that's quite an order, Sir Francis. Miss Mavro Cordato has been transferred to the catering department. Has <coughs> she? Yes, Transferring you to the catering department. I don't want the catering department. Look, I must have somebody. I'm not sure we have anyone available right now. Uh, I see. Well, it's very inconvenient, but I'll have to come there and finish the work in my office. Will you have a car set for me? That's transport. Putting you through. Transport. Hello, this is Sir Francis Hinsley. I'm coming into the studio. Will you send the car round for me immediately? Sir Francis Hinsley, let me see. No. What do you mean? No. Hello. Hello. Oh, Alan, don't say that. That's not decent. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me, I want to see Mr. Baumbein. There's a strange man in my office. One minute. Mr. Baumbein is in a conference right now. Shall I have him call you? I'll wait. Up to you. Go on, Alan, say it again. No, no. 
Spare the other. No, I can't say it. Not here. There's someone in the room. Some old guy who's been waiting 45 minutes. No, no, Johnny, I won't. <gasps> Look. Carrie. I gotta go. See you. Uh, Carrie, I'm just... Uh... Oh, hi, Frank. <laughs> Mighty nice of you to look us up. I appreciate that. I really do. Come again, Frank. Come often. I wanted to talk to you, Otto. Well, I'm rather busy right now, Frank. Uh, I'll say I give you a ring next week sometime. I've just found all my belongings in the garbage and a Mr. Medici in my office. Oh, why, yes, Frank. Only he says it Medici, like that. <laughs> now, you said it sounds kind of like a wop, and Mr. Medici is a very fine young man with a very fine and wonderful record, Frank, who I'd be proud to have you meet. I've just met him. So where do I work? Uh, all right. No one's told you, then. Told me what? Well, things get hung up sometimes, as you know. So many different departments have to give their okay. The legal branch, finance, labor disputes section, administration. But I don't anticipate any problems in your case. Luckily, you aren't a union man. Told me what? The letter is on its way. You had a record run. Just on 25 years, isn't it? And there's not even a provision in your contract for repatriation. <laughs> yep, your termination order whip right through. No problem at all. Hmm. Young Barlow found him. Barlow of Megalo? Uh, he used to be at Megalo's. His contract wasn't renewed. Mm. Yes, I heard. Shocking business. A bit before my time, Sir Francis. Uh, Does anyone know why he did it? His contract wasn't renewed either. Oh. <laughs> Hello, chaps. No doubt you've all heard this ghastly business about Frank. <laughs> yes. He fell on hard times in the end. I suppose I'm the only person left in Hollywood who remembers him in his prime. He did yeoman service. A scholar and a gentleman. Yes. Exactly. Yes. He was one of the first Englishmen of distinction to go into motion pictures. Mm. You might say he laid the foundations on which I, on which we all have built. Yes. He was our first ambassador, as well as the first president of this cricket club. Yes. I really think Megalo might have kept him on. They wouldn't have noticed his salary. Eh? Oh, it wasn't that. There were other reasons, as you may know. He took in a young Englishman called Dennis Barlow. Oh, eh? yes, Barlow came out here with a high reputation as a poet. Eh? He hasn't made good, I'm afraid. Eh? I advised him as bluntly as I could to clear out. I thought it was my duty to you all, and to him. Well, I think most of you know what his answer was. Eh? He took a job at the pet cemetery. <gasps> and that's why they sacked Sir Francis? Precisely. I've nothing to say against our American colleagues. They have their standards, that's all. Frank lost face. I will say no more. Now, I've left all the preliminary arrangements in Barlow's hands. Give him something worthwhile to do. <laughs> but this is an occasion when we've all got to rally round. Yeah. Fly the flag! That's it. What? I called Washington and asked them to send the ambassador to the funeral but it doesn't seem that they can manage it. I'll try again. It would make a lot of difference. In any case, I don't think the studios will keep away if they know we are solid. Good morning, sir. Welcome to Whispering Glade's Funeral Park. Uh, if you'd care to go through the gates, Dr. Kenworthy will welcome you. Uh, yes, thank you. I dreamed a dream, and I saw a new earth sacred to happiness. There, amid all that nature and art could offer to elevate the soul of man, I saw the happy resting place of countless loved ones. And I saw the waiting ones, who still stood on the brink of that narrow stream that now separated them from those that had gone before. Young and old, they were happy too. Happy in beauty. Happy in the certain knowledge that their loved ones were very near. In beauty and happiness such as the earth cannot give. I heard a voice say, do this. And behold, I awoke. And in the light and promise of my dream, I made. Whispering blades. Enter, stranger, and be happy. Forever yours, Wilbur Kenworthy, the Dreamer.
Thank you. I dreamed a dream and I saw a Excuse me. If you'd like to join the group, follow me. Toward this perfect replica of an old English manor, which, like all the buildings of Whispering Glades, is constructed throughout with grade A steel and concrete, with foundations extending into solid rock. Look, could you just tell me where the mortar is? The penultimate resting place of the loved ones is over there by the statue of the dreamer. <clears throat> As I was saying, the English manor is certified proof against fire, earthquake, and nuclear fission. Your name lives forever in Whispering Glades. Hello, can I help in any way? Uh, yes, hello. Um, I've come to arrange about a funeral. Is it for yourself? Oh, certainly not, no. Do I look as if I were about to croak? Sorry? To die? Why, no. Only many of our friends like to make before-need arrangements. Now, first I must record the loved one's essential data. Well, the client's name is, or well, was, Sir Francis Hinsley. And your name? Dennis Barlow. Now, what had you in mind, Mr. Barlow? Embalmment, it goes without saying. After that, incineration, perhaps. The heat in our crematory is so intense that all in essentials are volatilized. Normal disposition is by inhuman entombment, inurnment, or immurement, although when sarcophagus mint has become popular... Well, we want my friend buried. Buried? What was your loved one's business? He was a writer. Ah, then Poets' Corner would be the place for him. We have many of our foremost literary names there, either in person or as before need reservations. You are no doubt acquainted with the works of Amelia Bergson, author of Wafted by Angels? Not personally, no. We sold Miss Bergson a before need reservation only yesterday under the statue of the prominent Greek poet, Homer. I could put your friend right next to her. You see, I don't think we could wait for Miss Bergson to die. Was your loved one of any special religion? Agnostic. We have two non-sectarian churches in the park and a number of non-sectarian pastors who will omit references to God, if so requested. I believe Sir Ambrose Abercrombie is planning a special service. Oh, was your loved one in films, Mr. Barlow? In that case, he ought to be in Shadowland. I think he would prefer to be with Homer and Miss Bergson. As you wish. Now, for the leave-taking, I recommend the orchid room and half exposure in the casket. A gentleman's legs never look so well on the chaise long. But I say, I don't think that will quite do. You see, I've seen him. He's terribly disfigured, you know. Our cosmeticians have never failed yet, I assure you. We had a loved one last month who was found drowned. Only identified him by his wristwatch. They fixed that stiff. Stiff? So he looked like it was his wedding day. That's terribly comforting. I'll say it is. Now, I shall hand you over to Miss Thanatogenes, our cosmetician. Miss Thanatogenes! How many times do I have to tell you, Roger? I can't say it over the phone. I'd have to whisper it in your ear. <laughs> yeah, I know the phone is in your ear. <laughs> One minute. <coughs> Sir Ambrose Abercrombie to see you, Mr. Bombine. Anyway, Clark. Oh, Jimmy. I mean, Roger. Well, Sir Ambrose, here's mud in your eye. Uh, yes. Good health. Now, Mr. Baumbein, it's about Sir Francis. Sir Francis. Mm. Oh, yeah, the, the English guy. Mm. Now, I'm sure I heard something about him only the other day. He's dead. Yeah, that was it. We were hoping that Megalo might help give him the right send-off. Well, you know, he's, he's no longer on our payroll. I, I don't mean to be rude, Sir Ambrose, but a megalopolitan can't afford to associate itself with losers on the scrap heap. Even when you put them there? After all, his departure from Megalo and his departure from this mortal coil were not entirely unconnected, as the press may well surmise. Yeah, yeah, I see the problem. Mm. Yeah, if we're going to snub the guy, we should only snub him in private. <laughs> uh, reserve me the front four rows, and I'll provide the men in black suits. Any chance of one or two stars? Stars? No, no. Well, mm. I can get you their stand-in doubles, though. Yeah, yeah, we could promote press speculation as to who was really there. We could build this into the showbiz funeral of the year. Well, I don't really... And there's always Juanita Del Pablo. 
We could make the climax of the service her moving rendition of Cockles and Muscles. Mm. Well, it's the only Irish song she's learned so far. Mr. Barlow? What? Why are you? I'm the cosmetician. You're the cosmetician? Now, where did your loved one pass on from? Loved one? Oh, yeah, he hanged himself. Was his face much disfigured? Uh, hideously. Mm, that is quite usual. Mr. Joyboy will deal with that personally. It's a question of touch, you see. Massaging the blood from the congested areas. Mr. Joyboy has very wonderful hands. And what do you do? Hair, skin and nails. Was he a very cheerful old gentleman? No, rather the reverse. Then shall I put him down as serene and philosophical or judicial and determined? I think the former. It is the most difficult of all expressions to fix, but Mr. Joyboy makes it his specialty. That and the joyful smile for children. Did the loved one wear his own hair? Yes, he did, yes. And the normal complexion? We usually classify them as rural, athletic, and scholarly. That is to say, red, brown, and white. I would say scholarly with a touch of the rural. Mm. Did the loved one pass over with a rope? Braces, what you would call suspenders. That should be quite easy to deal with. Sometimes there is a permanent line left. We had a loved one last month who passed over with an electric cord. Even Mr. Joyboy could do nothing with that. We had to wind a scarf right up to the chin. You have a great regard for Mr. Joyboy, I notice. He is a true artist. I can say no more. Well, that completes my essential data. It has been a pleasure to make your acquaintance. And you too, you too, you too. So, um, do you enjoy your work? I regard it as a very, very great privilege, Mr. Barlow. Well... W when shall I see you again? The day after tomorrow. You had better arrive a little before the leave-taking to check that everything is as you wish. Who shall I ask for? Just say the cosmetician of the orchid room. No name? No name is necessary. Goodbye, Mr. Barlow. Goodbye. Miss Thanatogenous. Friends, you've been listening to The Loved One by Evelyn Wall, adapted for radio by Bill Matthews. I truly want our heartfelt thanks to go out to many, many people including Miranda Richardson, who appeared as Amy Thanatogenous, Rupert Graves as Dennis Barlow, Donald Pickering as Sir Ambrose Abercrombie, Ronald Fraser as Sir Francis Hinsley, Bob Sessions as Baumbine, Lorelai King as Mrs. Heinkel and the Mortuary Hostess, Garrick Hagen as Mr. Heinkel and the Voice of the Dreamer, Graham Hoadley as Mr. Schultz, Elizabeth Mansfield as Carrie, Simon Trees as Erickson, and David Bannerman as Schindler. The Loved One was produced by Lissa Evans. Amen.